Hey, I'm Amber Dunaway. I'm a student at Tennessee Tech University in Cookville, Tennessee. And this summer I received a grant to do honeybee research. Um, part of our grant was to raise queens. And um, what we did is we grafted cells to produce queens that are, um, or queens that have high quality genetics so that they would be resistant to the Varroa mite. Um, also, part of my grant was to make a documentary to send out to high schools around uh, Tennessee so that um, students could get a deeper knowledge of honeybees and how important they are to our daily lives and to our agriculture in the United States today. Honeybees the great foragers of the earth are essential to the production of agricultural crops in the United States. This insect is responsible for pollinating around 80% of all fruits, vegetables, and seed crops in the United States today. Honeybees are primarily associated with the production of honey. This thick golden liquid provides the bees with high energy food to constantly feed new generations of honeybees. Forager bees fly out of the hive and travel miles to collect pollen and nectar. The honeybee finds the nectar and stores it in her honey stomach. When she returns to their colony, the honeybee will deposit the nectar into storage cells where it will be worked and reworked by the bees until the sugar content is high enough to be preserved as honey. Then it is capped with beeswax and stored for later use. Most beekeepers will collect a portion for human use. This is a frame of honey and it's fully capped. And to get the honey to come out, we have to cut it off, the capped part off. All right, and now I'm gonna insert this into the honey extractor. All right, I'm putting the last of our frame of honey in. And we are ready to extract honey. Okay, um, now we're gonna turn this up um, so it'll sling all the honey out of all the frames. And we'll turn it up to about medium speed and we won't turn it any higher or else the comb will start falling out. Okay, so now I'm gonna let the honey um, flow out and we'll put it through three uh, different filters to get it um, completely cleaned. The home of the honeybee is called a colony. The colony is run by a caste system. There are three castes, many workers, a few drones, and one queen. Each caste has a special job to perform. The drone, stouter than the others, will mate with the queen. This is his primary job. Once the mating has taken place, the drone will die. The worker bees make up the body of the hive. They are constantly raising young. They perform numerous duties such as cleaning the hive, feeding the brood, caring for the queen, making orientation flights, comb building, ventilating the hive, filling comb with pollen, water, nectar, or honey, and guarding the hive. I got my first beehives, bee colonies, when I was um, a freshman in high school. At that time in Upper East Tennessee, they still were keeping bees in what they call gums, hollow trees. 
And uh, a neighbor of mine uh, gave me two swarms in gums. And um, I kept them uh, through college. And then they died out. And I got some more. And um, then uh, life got in the way. I finished college. Uh, went to Louisiana. Lost my bees. Uh, my dad-in-law had kept them for me for a while. But then I lost them. And I didn't get started back until about uh, eight, ten years ago. Uh, I got a faculty grant to do a little bee genetic study. I'd been hearing all about the loss of the honeybees. And at that time, about 80% of the feral colonies in the United States were gone. And uh, having an interest in genetics, being a student of genetics, I got to thinking about uh, trying to develop locally adapted queens uh, that were resistant to the mites and diseases that are facing honeybees right now. Um, I, through that grant, we got uh, six colonies for Tech, and Tech's never been without at least one since that time, though we've uh, lost down to one a time or two. Uh. When, when I was 15, uh, I became interested. My grandfather had always had bees, and uh, I went to him. He, he just actually lived next door, and I, I told him I was interested in, in getting into the honeybees, and he, uh, he helped me catch some swarms at that time, and uh, we actually hand-built my hives, and, and I got started and uh, been in it ever since. This yard here, what I've mostly got here, uh, the full-size colonies you see are, are what we refer to as production colonies. The, the smaller colonies, like this one right here behind me, it actually contains my breeder queen, uh, and, and uh, that's what we use to graft from. The main part of my business is queen rearing, uh, and, and we, uh, we graft uh, and raise queens for sale throughout the country. Uh, when I joined, uh, the agriculture program at my high school. Um, my ag teacher taught us a lesson about honeybees and ever since then I have been um, absolutely fascinated by everything about them and wanted to pursue um, just learning more about them um, and just kind of becoming a honeybee scientist and uh, being an expert about them. That is my goal. You will only find one queen in a hive might be hard to find her among all the buzzing. Her long abdomen sets her apart. Some beekeepers mark their queens, making it easier to find her. The queen's job is to mate and lay eggs. A queen can lay from 1,500 to 2,000 eggs a day. They can live three to five years, but many do not live for more than one season. The, the queen, uh is the mother of the colony. Uh, she, uh, her pheromones is kindly the glue that holds the whole colony together. Uh, w without that, uh, they're in disarray. The, uh, the queen though, people think that she makes all the decisions and, and she doesn't. Uh, worker bees build the uh, cells uh, either in worker size, queen size, or drone size. The queen then measures it with her antennas uh, when she goes in the cell and she knows whether to lay, uh, you know, a drone, a fertilized egg or a non-fertilized egg. Uh, but, but still, it's her pheromone that keeps everybody working together and coordinating things. The workers actually make more of the decisions than the queens do. At first, I wanted to raise my own queens. I wanted to artificially inseminate my own queens. Uh, Mike Haney and I went to the, uh, the queen rearing school in, in Michigan and the gentleman that taught it said before you start artificially inseminating queens you need, you need some genetic, a genetic package that's worth, uh, that's worth artificially inseminating. So then I, I started stepping back, here's what we need to do. We need to select queens from colony or select eggs from queens of colonies that have survived over long periods of time. Obviously they're well adapted to the region. Obviously they must be resistant to the 
uh, to the disease and parasite problem because they've survived. And so that's what you and I have been trying to do is taking those queens from, uh, um, from uh, long established colonies and produce more of those genetics, putting them in other colonies. Honeybees must gather pollen and nectar for their survival. However, while they do this, they are also providing humans with a great service, pollination of our crops. Pollination is the fertilization of a flowering plant. Without honeybees, crop yields would greatly decline, and some crops, such as the almond tree, that depend entirely on honeybee pollination would become extinct. The importance of the honeybee, a lot of people, especially young kids, when I go do talks for them at school and stuff, I'll, I'll ask them, what's the most important thing that honeybees do? And of course, the first answer from all of them is honey, honey. Well, we all enjoy honey, but that is not the most important thing we get from the honeybee. Pollination is by far the most important thing the honeybee does for us as humans. Uh, by, by going uh, from flower to flower and pollinating the crops, uh, for example, apples uh, can be up to 10% larger just from being pollinated by honeybees. And, and the thing about honeybees that makes them more important than all the other insects that do some of the pollination, bees are crop specific. And what I mean is when they start working a crop and, and say, uh, let's just use squash for example, a uh, farmer rents hives to pollinate his squash. When bees start working a crop, they will work that crop entirely uh, until it's gone. They won't work anything else. Then at that time when it plays out, they'll move to something else whatever it might be, apples, uh, but, but they will only work one source until it's gone. And, and then honeybee colonies uh, during the summer will be at a population of around 60,000. There's no other insect that contains a colony with that number. So you can tell that that's an enormous workforce to, to do the pollination. I feel like the most important thing that any everyone should know about honeybees is how they are um, so responsible for pollination of our uh, crops in um, America. Um, without honeybees, we would not be able to eat the food we do and the food would not be as nutritious for us as it is today. As honeybees have been transported around the world, they have been exposed to diseases, parasites, and chemicals that have led to the death of many colonies throughout the world. This is a serious world event and continues to be a challenge to the survival of honeybee colonies and to the beekeeper. The varroa mite is a parasite that is the number one plague affected colonies. The mite is suspected of being the carrier of many of the other viral diseases that plague honeybees. Beekeepers should do a mite count on their colonies at least twice a year and treat to keep the mite population down within the colony. The small hive beetle is another pest you will commonly see within a colony. These beetles do little damage, but do present stress in the colony, and they can destroy frames of honeycomb in the larval stage. As we talked about, the, the honeybee's main importance is pollination. Uh, and in the last few years, uh, with mites and chemicals, uh, our honeybees have been devastated. Uh, as a matter of fact, at least 95 to 98 percent of our wild feral colonies are gone. Uh, so the only thing remaining is what apiarists are, are keeping on their homes, at their homes uh, and farms. One thing that uh, greatly affects the colonies today is uh, pesticides and mites. Um, the two biggest ones are the hive beetle. You'll often see the hive beetle as soon as you open any colony. Um, it just is an annoyance to the colonies um, and it can make the colonies really weak. Um, then the other big one is called the varroa mite um, and it starts growing in the egg cells that the queen lays and so from the larva stage it is uh, affecting the honeybees and, um, and it is like one of the biggest um, carriers of tons of diseases and so it has a huge impact on the colonies. The worker bees and the queen bee are females but the workers are not reproductively developed. 
The honeybee colonies produce new queen bees by feeding the larva more of a special feed called royal jelly. Honeybees can be induced to produce new queens by manipulation of the colony. Beekeepers can take advantage of this behavior of honeybees to produce more queens that are more resistant to the varroa mites and other diseases and pest problems. Ridge Top Apiaries is located in Middle Tennessee in the hills of the Cumberland Plateau. Here we will learn about the importance of rearing queens with high quality genetics. What we're raising here is uh, VSHBs and what that stands for is varroa sensitive hygienic. Uh, the Varroa mite, uh, it, it hit our part of the country in the early 80s and, uh, and at that time our bees had no resistance. Uh, European bees did have resistance and, and the USDA, they acquired uh, some of their genetics and have been breeding these queens out of uh, Baton Rouge down at the USDA Bee Lab. Uh, and they've now got those VSH queens distributed to uh, people that produce uh, inseminated queens and, and we purchase them as bee breeders uh, from those people. Uh, we are uh, uh, grafting from those breeder queens uh, to uh, produce queens that will uh, since the varroa uh, mite underneath the cap brood and, and those bees use their hygienic behavior to uh, chew that larva out and remove it from the hive and uh, because the varroa mite breeds and reproduces underneath the cap brood uh, they uh, remove that and thus it uh, reduces your mite load on your colonies. And, and the, the Varroa Destructor, the, the mite that I'm talking about, is still to this day the number one enemy of our honeybees. It's still what's devastating the colonies. We're running about a 30 percent loss through winters because of it. My interest in queen rearing is totally genetic. We've got the problem, primary problem, I think, with the diseases is the varroa mite because the varroa mite is probably carrying many of the viral diseases that are killing bees. So not only do we have that mite hanging off the back of hundreds of bees, uh, which uh, uh, are going to uh, impair their function and eventually kill them, we have that mite uh, introducing into that colony viruses that are probably that may be related to some of these other factors like colony collapse disorder uh, so here here's what I think we have to do uh, uh, to be successful at this uh, we we need bees that are resistant to the varroa mite may be resistant to the some of the, of the other diseases but that are also adapted to Middle Tennessee, or if you're in another area, another area, uh, the South or the West or the or the North, because uh, uh, species develop a natural adaptation to their environment. So we need to produce uh, queens that 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 are adapted to the Upper Cumberland region of Middle Tennessee or the Upper Cumberland region at least that are also resistant to the, uh, the varroa mite disease. Scientists throughout the country are trying to develop ways to increase the population of honeybee colonies and ensure their survival and success through genetics, evaluation of pesticide toxicity levels, disease and parasite control, and other environmental and behavioral factors. The average person, homeowner, one of the things that they can do uh, especially if they own a little piece of property, uh, instead of keeping it mowed and pristine and, and pretty like a golf course, would be to let it grow up in wildflowers and, and, and give the bees something to work on to uh, make their life less stressful. Uh, be careful in, in just your home gardens with, with using some of the pesticides. Uh, seven dust is especially deadly. Uh, if you've got to use something, uh, use some of the organic uh, compounds. Uh, 
Captain Jacks and some of those that are liquid sprays, avoid the dust. Uh, seven dust, the bees uh, pack that back to the colony uh, in, in their uh, pollen baskets and, uh, and then it, it wipes out the whole colony. So being aware of uh, the chemicals you use around your home uh, that's deadly to honeybees uh, is something that would be very helpful. Uh, uh, spraying fruit trees and stuff, spray them late in the evening after the honeybees have quit working. Uh, that, that's very helpful. The biggest thing that probably affects our bees is pesticides and people using them unresponsibly. Um, they just spray them everywhere and don't think about what they're doing to honeybees and also what they're doing to us. Um, but that really affects the honeybees. It confuses their senses. Um, and so they go back to their hive and they just are all confused and it weakens their immune system and causes the colony to um, feel great losses. You can go to the internet and you can find uh, 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 plants that are bee friendly. Just because it flowers doesn't necessarily mean it's a good nectar producer. And uh, so I would encourage um, uh, urban areas and suburbs to, uh, to plant uh, flowers and, and, and shrubs that are bee friendly and it'll depend on what area you're in. Uh, this is a hard thing to say as an agriculturalist, but we have really hurt the bee population uh, by, by herbicide use, by, by keeping weeds down. And I'm not suggesting, suggesting people need to leave weeds in their cultivated crops. I am suggesting it doesn't hurt anything in fence rows uh, uh, along the edges of your pasture, along the edges of your field. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, Perilla mint is toxic to cattle, it, but they will hardly eat it unless they don't have anything else to eat. Uh, Perilla mint is a pretty good bee feed. It produces pretty good nectar. It blooms this little later than this. Uh, so uh, I would encourage farmers to leave areas just like you leave bird sanctuaries and rabbit sanctuaries. I would encourage farmers to leave uh, areas that are bee friendly. If we don't do something to turn this around uh, like Europe has done, uh, with the vanishing of the honeybees, this, this country is going to see a, a dramatic drop in our food sources uh, uh, to the point, I mean, we could actually see some starvation. Uh, so it, it, we've got to do something uh, to, to benefit these honeybees uh, if we expect to keep eating.